Hello, church. Ooh, that's pretty hot. You can turn that down a wee bit. Thank you very much. Ah, that's better. Whew. All right, well, welcome. Uh, if you're visiting, and I know there happens to be one visitor tonight, so be sure you all extend a hand of fellowship to that person. I won't embarrass her. Oh, there's a clue. If you're visiting with us, thanks for sharing the evening. We appreciate that very much. Um, the last time I taught, I taught on the uh, introduction to worship. And so we're going to continue um, in that short series about worship. And so if you were here last time, what we learned was we learned that worship is glorifying God uh, with, our, with our hearts, with our voices, and with our spirits. It's a, it's a heart attitude um, issue. It's, it's not a music issue. It's not a preference issue. Uh, so worship is active. It's something that we do. And we can worship with our voices, obviously, through music, prayer, sharing the gospel with others. Uh, we can worship God with our service to his church and to others. Uh, we learned that music can be used in worship, but music, music does not necessarily equal worship. Uh, we can also worship without music, as we all do. So worship is giving God the glory he rightly deserves because of who he is. And that leads us to today's message. Exactly who are we worshiping? So in his book, Ron Owens in his book, Return to Worship, wrote the following. The importance of establishing who we are worshiping in our minds as we look at the subject of worship cannot be overemphasized. Much of today's controversy in the area of worship would be resolved if God's people would settle once and for all that God alone is God and that he is the same God who is revealed in the Bible and that he has not changed. He's just as holy as he ever was. He's just as majestic as he ever was. His standards have not changed. His requirements for approaching him have not changed. That is why the fundamental issue today is not the how of worship, but the who of worship, end quote. So it's not styles or preferences that should be our primary concern when it comes to worshiping God, the God of the Bible. Instead of spending a lot of time discussing how we should worship or what type of music we should be singing or playing, we need to be asking God to help us change the way we think about him we need a better understanding of who he really is we need a transformation of our minds which will then change our hearts we need for god to restore a true love for who he really is the god of scripture not the god of our own imaginations we need a revival of sorts that will bring back the fear, the awe, and the reverence of who he is. And unless that happens, some churches will go on dividing their congregation by musical preferences. Some churches will go on discussing how they can accommodate the world and make outsiders feel comfortable inside of their church building. What should be our concern is what's happening right here at Anchor Bible Church. How does this apply to us right here and right now? So each one of us must personally make the adjustments in our own hearts so that we as a church can be true worshipers of the God of Scripture. Our view of who we worship will automatically determine how we worship. Our view of God will directly impact how we approach Him. And I can think of no better place than to increase our understanding of who God is than the book of Job. Turn with me to Job chapter 38. Give you a little bit of introduction as we get going here because we're not going to go through the whole book, but we are going to go through quite a few of the last four chapters. So one of the best known examples of what would be considered undeserved suffering is recorded in the book of Job. In a matter of minutes, Job, who was a prominent, wealthy, godly man, lost all his material possessions, he lost all of his children, and he lost his health. His wife gave him no support. She suggested that in his misery, he ought to just curse God and die. 
And on top of all that, his friends, they weren't very helpful either. It even seemed like God wasn't there for him. Seemed to be ignoring him by refusing to, for such a very long time, to even answer Job. So Job's intense suffering was financial, it was emotional, it was physical, and it was spiritual. Everyone was against him, including, it seemed, even God, whom he had faithfully served. Yet according to the scriptures, Job was a spiritually and morally upright man. Could any suffering be more undeserved? And people often ask, isn't it, isn't it a righteous person supposed to just be blessed? No suffering, no pain, no sorrow. The fact that Job, an outstanding citizen, an upright person, had so much and then lost it all makes him the supreme example of affliction that defies human understanding. A lot of people identify with Job. Maybe some of you do, because they can relate to his difficulties that were agonizing and seemingly unfair. Many people wonder they, why they go through suffering, why they should experience tragedy, heartache through suffering. Suffering's hard. It's hard to understand, especially when it strikes the seemingly undeserving when pain and suffering does not seem to be punishment for wrongdoing, then it becomes extremely puzzling for us. The book of Job addresses the mystery of undeserved suffering, showing us that in adversity, God may have other purposes besides punishment for wrongdoing. The book of Job addresses the issue of attitudes in affliction. Job's experience demonstrates that a believer, while undergoing intense, intense agony, does not have to renounce God or curse God. Question him, sure, but not deny him. We may long for an explanation for what's happening in our lives, but not being able to understand what's going on is not a reason to curse God. Job may have come close to that, but he never did. In fact, he did the one thing that Satan said he would, didn't do the one thing Satan said he was going to do, right? In the beginning of the book, Satan said, you take everything away from me, he'll curse you. Well, he never did that. So, after 37 chapters, Job's talking with his friends. His friends are talking with him and giving them their counsel. God finally gives Job what he's been asking for, an audience with God himself. However, Things didn't quite turn out the way Job was anticipating. So there's three things I want you to pay attention to as we're going through the text. Number one, as we look at God questioning Job, pay really close attention to who God really is. And you'll see it. You'll see it in the questions. Number two, as God questions Job, remember it's only God who can answer the questions that he's even asking of Job. And number three, watch God's tone with Job in the beginning. It'll turn out better than it starts. All right? So with that said, let's go to verse 1. Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. So God's appearance here is accompanied with a storm or whirlwind. The word that's translated storm is the Hebrew word that means a tempest or a storm. Uh, it, it, it means the idea of a, even a whirlwind, um, a violent kind of a wind. So if you remember the story, it was a mighty wind that caused the death of Job's sons and daughters. And now this violent wind accompanies God's visit with Job. The first storm brought ruin, resulting in personal sorrow. This one brings revelation, which will ultimately lead to personal submission. Sometimes God brings storms into our lives to get us to be more submissive to Him, to get our minds and our lives more focused on Him. Notice verse 2. God opens with a bit of a rebuke. 
Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So God accuses Job of darkening counsel without knowledge. Literally, it means speaking vainly, ineffectively, or useless speech. And as we'll find out, Job didn't really know what he was talking about when he blamed God for being unfair. Job's words were without knowledge. So next, God tells Job to get ready for his questions. He says, gird up. Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. So this term gird up, it's the idea, if you remember, you probably heard about this, but back in the olden days, they'd have like the long robe thing, and they'd have a sash. Well, the idea was, if you're going to try to run or do work, you've got to get that long robe thing. It's like running in a dress. You can't do it, right? So gird it up, pick it up, tuck it in the sash so your legs are free to move more freely. That's what God's telling Job to do here. Tuck your outer garment into your sash belt, as a man did before its strenuous work or running. So the idea here is that Job is to be alert so he can answer God's questions. By the way, this is a complete reversal of Job's words to God earlier in the story, back in chapter 31, 35, when Job said, let the Almighty answer me. All right. God begins his questions. Look at verse 4. He starts with questions about the earth. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? So creating the earth here is depicted like the construction of a building with a foundation and dimensions and a measuring line and footings and a cornerstone. And notice Job is immediately confronted with his insignificance. He wasn't there when God created the earth, nor was any other human being. Since Job did not observe what had taken place, he couldn't answer and he couldn't understand it. So how could he possibly advise God? Job wasn't there when the morning stars sang. The angels, the sons of God who shouted for joy over God's creation of the earth. Look at verse 8. Next, there are going to be some questions about the sea. Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it, and I set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. The origin of the oceans here is described like childbirth. Job wasn't in God's delivery room when he created the oceans, the seas, which are described like a baby coming forth from the womb. It was God who confined the waters by means of shorelines. God separated the waters on the earth from the land. Also above the earth's waters, he placed the clouds, which, like a baby's garment, shrouding the sea at night in thick darkness. God obviously had these uh, worldwide creation moments under his total control. Notice the eyes. Did you notice that? Go back to verse 9. When I made a cloud, verse 10, when I placed boundaries on it, verse 11, when I, set, sorry, verse 10 again, when I set a bolt and boundaries on it, verse 11, when I said thus far, you shall come and no farther. God's kind of giving him a clue there, isn't he? All right, let's look at verse 12 through 15, because the next thing, He's going to be God's mighty power. Verse 12, have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and they stand forth like a garment. And from the wicked their light is withheld, an uplifted arm is broken. So God's control of the earth also includes the daily sequence of the dawn 
and the darkness, the daytime and the nighttime, the sunrise and the sunset. In this passage, the dawn causes the wicked who are active at night to hide. It's as if the morning light were shaking them out of a blanket, causing them to lose their power. As the sun comes up, the wicked no longer have the darkness in which to hide and work. And since Job had nothing to do with establishing or controlling this aspect of creation, how could he question what God was doing at that moment in his life? Look at verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me all. Tell me if you know all this. God humbles Job by asking if he'd ever explored such unseen realms as the springs of the sea or the depths of the ocean or death pictured here as having gates which open for, ent for its entrance and, and as being in darkness or the expansive regions of the earth, some of which to this day we have not even explored. Job had not, but God had. Look at verse 19. Where's the way of the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the path to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Ouch. So here God personified light and darkness as living houses, dwelling places, again with questions which Job couldn't possibly answer. God pointed out to Job that he, a human being, had no way, no way of following the light at sunset to see where it goes or of pursuing the darkness at sunrise to see where it goes. Their places and dwellings are inaccessible in the sense that Job could not explain how God moves the earth around the sun. Look at verse 21. He says, you know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. I think this is God's way of proving that Job didn't know since he was not around when God set the earth's rotation in motion. Job's years were very few compared to God's eternity. Well, next he's going to ask him some questions about the sky. Look at verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle? Where is the way that the light is divided, or the east wind scattered on the earth? Job had no idea how God makes snow or hail pictured as if they were kept in storehouses and then released whenever God chooses. And, you know, sometimes God uses weather for various reasons, sometimes to get people's attention, sometimes to stop people from working, occasionally to discipline or, or punish uh, rebellious people. But Job, Job couldn't predict where God would dispense lightning flashes or where the winds would blow. Look at verses 22. Again, the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle. Now, keep your finger right there in Job, and I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 17. This is fascinating. When I hear all the pages stop turning, I'll know you're ready. Revelation 16, starting at verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came from the temp temple, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty, 
And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Notice this. And huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. I just find that absolutely fascinating. We just read in Job, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle? That's something for y'all to think about this week. Who is this God we're worshiping? He's got this all laid out already. All right, back to Job. Flip your finger back over there. I'll let you chew on that over the week. All right, let's look at verse 25, talking about rain in the unseen places. Who has cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven? Who has given it birth? Water becomes hard like a stone, and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. So God's ways with rain and ice, we can't comprehend it. Only God cuts a channel. It's a figurative, figuratively speaking here. Cuts a channel. It's an imaginary path in the sky through which the rain and the thunderstorms come. Man doesn't even see where God causes rain to fall in a desert wasteland. It's amazing. Every now and again, if you watch some of the old National Geographic shows, they go out to these w places where it's just desolate. There is no man, and it's desert. And then all of a sudden, the rains. It's just enough rain, and they do that stop-action photography where the flowers start to bloom. That's God doing that. The man doesn't even see where God causes the rain to fall in these desert wastelands. Again, he uses a figure of childbirth. Uh, God asking Job if he knew whether the rain and dew have a father and the ice and the frost have a mother. The point is, no one knows completely how God sends rain and formulates the elements of cold weather, including dew, ice, frost. So God continues asking, asking Job questions. Now he's going to ask about the stars. Look at verse 31. Job, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear without with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Pleiades, Orion, the bear, they're all constellations of stars. Anybody into astronomy at all? Nobody. I got one up front. Got a couple. Guess what? Those constellations are still there. That was a long time ago when this was written. Job knew that God made the constellations, but here God points out that Job had nothing to do with holding together the cluster of stars known as Pleiades. Nor could he alter the configuration of the stars in, uh, in the Orion constellation. Nor could he cause the bear, that's Ursa Major, to appear at night. And since Job knew nothing of the laws of heaven, the principles by which God regulates the stars, the planets, the moon, how could he even begin to criticize God for his dealings with mankind? Dominion over the earth and the affairs of men is by God's sovereign power. No one else's. Look at verses 34. Hey, Job, can you lift up your voice and 
to the clouds so that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or has given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clods stick together? God continues to ask questions that show Job just how weak and powerless he really is. In verse 34, Job, can you speak to the clouds and tell them to rain on you? When you're hot and ask for rain, Job, do the clouds obey you? Verse 35, Job, can you command the lightning bolts? Do they talk to you? Neither Job nor any other man can call a single lightning bolt down from heaven. Only God can cause that to happen. Verse 36, Job, was it you who gave mankind intellect, wisdom, and the ability to reason? God is the author and giver, the father and fountain of all wisdom and understanding that mankind may have. You see, no one has a right to boast about their intelligence because it's God that gave it to us. Verse 37, Job, can you send just enough rain to water the hardened ground, but not so much that it floods it? God has the clouds under his complete control, and man does not. Can anyone with all their wisdom count the clouds or completely explain them and describe the nature of them? Even though they are near us in our own atmosphere, yet we know a little more of them than we do about the stars, which are light years away from us. And when the clouds have poured down the rain so that the the dry dust turns into usable soil. Job, can you stop the rain of heaven with your voice? There was only one human being that ever stopped the rain and the storm, and that was Jesus. So what are the lessons for us? We need to recognize the power and goodness of God, both. He gives the earth enough rain, but he does not flood it again, as he said he wouldn't in the days of Noah. He softens it, but he doesn't drown it. He makes it fit for the plow, but not unfit for the seed. It's only God who can command a shower of rain or a beautiful sunny day. We don't have that power. We are constantly dependent upon him. Even those who will not acknowledge God are still dependent upon him. I'm going to stop right here. Because verses 39 to 41 begins another set of questions from God to Job about caring for the animals that God created. That is going to be a fascinating time. We need to understand that for every question that God asked Job, Job could not answer. God could answer because God has all knowledge. It was God who laid the foundations of the universe, He set the measurements. He was there when the angels sang at his glorious creation. It was God who set the boundaries for the seas and said, Thus far and no farther shall your proud ways go. It was God who created daylight and darkness. He also knows all the wicked and what they're doing in the darkness. There's no hiding from him. It's God who's been to the depths of the ocean. He's seen the deep dark of a place called the Marianas Trench. When I was a young man, I wanted to be an oceanographer, and that fascinated me. The Marianas Trench is 39,000 feet deep, and God's been there. He alone understands the expanse of the earth. God knows about the winds and the storehouses of the snow and the hail, even the hail that he's reserved for judgment during the Great Tribulation. It's God who waters both the seen and the unseen places of the earth. It's God who created, created and sustains the planets and the star clusters, Pleiades, Orion, the bear, and all the rest of them. As Job saw them, we still see them today. As easy as it is for God to send forth the rain and the lightning, 
it's just as easy for him to give men and women wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge. So here's my question. Are you starting to see who it is that we're the, to worship? Are you starting to get a bigger picture of the God of the Scriptures? This God. Not the God of our imaginations. We've just begun to scratch the surface of who God really is. And I think it's a lifetime, a lifelong journey. One thing we know for sure, just from what we looked at, is God is sovereign. He's sovereign. And that gives him and him alone the right to do what he does without explanation. Gives him the right to call Brad home to his reward and eternal life. Even though we may not be ready, we weren't ready for him to go, that was God's sovereign, providential right. And we can rejoice in knowing that God is good and loving and gracious and merciful and forgiving. And he loves his creation and his creatures so much so that he was willing to redeem us through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. By the way, what is what does the New Testament tell us? Who made, who made the creation? All things were made by him, right? It was the Lord Jesus who was there at the day of creation. Next week, we'll continue our search for who God really is. We're going to be studying Job chapter 39. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We are in awe and we are humbled by what we've just read. And in all of your power and all of your might and all of your majesty, help us to remember that there is still this amazing love for your creatures. A love that would be willing to pay the penalty that we could not pay. That Jesus would pay a debt that he did not owe. Thank you for that. I pray this week as each one of us goes about our, our day that we'll remember some of these things we've read about tonight. Your power and your majesty. and You're the only one, one and only. There is no other. And we're grateful that you love us. We're grateful that you provide for us. And we're grateful that we can trust you forever and always. Thank you for this time together. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen.